Good evening or good morning. This is the um, lecture on uh, atoms, the third week of Physics 102. So this is going to be a recorded lecture, and as such, you can uh, watch it as you like. Um, you can f f skip forward or go back or take a coffee break in between. So we're going to be talking a lot about atoms. First off, there's there are lots of images of atoms around. And um, but most of them are actually not very physical. An atom really looks like this picture. There's a nucleus at the center, which is smaller than a pinprick on the scale of this figure. It's about 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of an atom. It's tiny. And then swirling around this nucleus, which is positively charged because it's filled with protons, swirling around are electrons. The electrons themselves are too small to measure. They're tiny. And there's, there's, they swirl around almost randomly. And we'll see, in fact, they follow a pattern, but it's not completely random. So that's what an atom looks like physically. Now, what about, what about how do you measure atoms? What about them? Well, let's just start out by saying that everything in your whole life that you've ever seen or touched close by or far away, everything has been made out of atoms. Everything is some arrangement of atoms. All of the colors you see, everything comes from an atom. So atoms are really essential to understanding nature and what you're looking at. And also, atoms are the bridge point to chemistry. When you start putting atoms together, you make molecules. And uh, chemistry is the wonderful subject of all the wonderful things you can do with molecules. Now, I like to break atoms into two parts. One is the mechanical part. The fact that you can uh, not knock on a table or, uh, or, or touch something is a mechanical property. So some things, for example, like the springs you uh, dealt with uh, last week are, are very springy. Okay, they're very soft. Other things like a piece of steel is very hard. So these are all mechanical properties. In a general sense, you can say that atoms act like tennis balls with Velcro on them. You can take two tennis balls and you can kind of squish them together, but not very much. And you can try to pull them apart, but not very much. Okay, they're, they're held together by a, by a fairly weak force. So the mechanical properties govern all of the mechanical things like rubber and things that are hard and things that are soft. But then more interestingly, there are the electrical properties. Atoms absorb light and they emit light. And the light come in precise energies. Now the energy of a photon of light is the same thing, is, is corresponds directly to the wavelength of the light, which corresponds directly to color. That is to say color as perceived by the molecules in our retina, okay? Now, these atoms are filled with electrons, and the electrons inside the atom, they occupy specific energy states. And these specific energy states are called energy levels. As we'll see, we'll make drawings of these. Now, all of this is understood by noting that there's a po heavy positive nucleus, very, very massive, and electrons are swirling around it. And so now you can make up all the atoms of the periodic table, um, with that model. And so the next next uh, figure here is, is the periodic table of the elements. All known atoms, including all the artificially produced atoms beyond uranium, are all in this table. Now, it's rather busy, okay? I mean, if you haven't seen this before, uh, it's rather busy. But in the upper left-hand corner is, he is hydrogen. That's the simplest element. One proton, one electron going around the proton. And the upper right-hand corner is helium, okay? And that has two protons and two electrons around it. So I won't go into this here, otherwise, uh, but it's uh, sometimes very good for reference. As far as making molecules is concerned, uh, well, let me say the fundamentally wonderful thing about a per the periodic table is that if you take all of the atoms in one vertical column, for example, the column below hydrogen, so hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, all of those elements have very similar chemical properties. As we'll see, the outer electrons are all in the same basic spatial configuration. And then all of the um, 
And then, and then on the right hand side, for example, there's underneath fluorine, that's uh, the second row from the right, that's fluorine, underneath fluorine is chlorine, and bromine, and iodine, which you've probably heard of these things in medical senses. And um, all, of the, all of these elements have, this, again, the same chemical properties as fluorine. So if you can take hydrogen, you can combine it with chlorine and make hydrogen chloride. Or you can combine it with bromine and make hydrogen bromide. Or you can take lithium and combine it with fluorine, have lithium fluoride. All of these molecules exist because um, of the similar chemical properties of all the elements in one column. Okay, so now let's go to, um, so, so, so then you, you can talk about a, an atom as um, ha, there's an electron cloud around the atom. And so this is a, a repeat. If you have two atoms nearby, and uh, it may be that, for example, in the atom on the left-hand side, there's an atomic state, a quantum state, at a lower energy than the, than the atom on the right-hand side. So an electron can jump across from one, av one atom to another. If the atoms are close enough, the electron can just jump across. And it lowers the energy, and that's why it's preferable. And having done that, these two atoms can attract each other and make a molecule. Okay, and then the, the attractive force between them governs what kind of material is Is it a crystal or is it just only a gas and so on. Now, this is the, a plot actually of the energy between the energy of two atoms as a function of how far apart they are. Now, I apologize, this is a plot, it has a name, but um, first off, the vertical axis is the energy of the two atoms. Okay. The lower the energy of the two atoms together, the more stable they are. Okay? Going across the right-hand side is, the, is R, which is the separation between the two atoms. So now, if you take the two atoms and separate them by a lot, far apart, then the, the, the energy, which is this red curve, the energy is zero. I mean, the, 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 basic, the energy is zero between the two. Okay? There's just nothing to do with each other, right? As you bring them closer and closer together, the energy goes down. This red curve goes down. It goes down through a minimum. And so it, it, when they're just, just the right distance apart, they're the most stable. In order to push them closer together, you have to put more energy in, and the red curve climbs up. So the stable position is right down at the bottom of this bowl. Now, that's, called, uh, that's labeled as A in this diagram. Maybe the lattice constant is called, right? Now... This maybe this maybe uh, is is rather complex. If you don't see curves before and so on, it, maybe it's a little complicated. But the important thing is down at the bottom, it's like you put a marble in a bowl, and the marble it just sloshes back and forth inside the bowl. Okay, well these two atoms do the same thing. They slosh back and forth as if they're in the bottom of a well. The bottom of this well, the shape of the curve, is exactly the shape of the energy of a spring. So remember, when you stretched a spring, you had to do work with your hands to stretch it. When you let it go, it went back again, and it went to the other side and went back again, and it oscillated back and forth. The mass on a spring was an oscillator. These two atoms together are an oscillator, too, with the same formula. Frequency is much higher, but it's the same thing. So that's the Fundamentally, this, is, this would be related to the elasticity. If it's a soft spring, this would be a very flat curve. And if it's, if it's a very strong piece of metal or something, or a crystal, for example, it would be much sharper. So those are like, the, this, this one curve, um, it actually appears in the textbook three different times in three different places because this curve is so important. It explains so much about materials and atoms. Okay, so taking that a little further, up on the upper left, there are eight caricatures of atoms, okay? But a perfectly good model of atoms is to replace the nucleus by some, by some mass, M, and connect all the atoms together in a matrix with springs. Now, this is an old-fashioned, looks like an old-fashioned mattress, actually, okay? But this model works extremely well. This ex completely describes, for example, the, the bending of, say, a, a, a ruler or a or a beam in a building or anything like that. On the outside, the strings are stretched. On the inside, the springs are compressed. So it takes energy to bend something, 
to bend the, for example, a plastic ruler, you have to bend it, okay? And what you're doing is stretching and compressing these springs, and this is a perfectly good model, okay? Now, you can actually, these days, you can actually look at atoms. I mean, this is Michael Tringiti's lab. He has a scanning tunneling microscope, so you can actually, in, you can actually image individual atoms, and these happen to be lead atoms on a silicon uh, substrate, actually. And uh, Professor Tringidis knows the size of his field of view. It's up and down is 13 and a half nanometers, right? So you count the atoms, and you know it's 13.5 nanometers. So now you know the size of a lead atom just by counting, just by looking. This is another uh, image. This is of graphene. Graphene is 100% carbon atoms all connected together in a hexagonal matrix. This is from Nate Anderson, who just recently got his PhD. Here's the scale, three nanometers. Again, you can just count and figure out how big a carbon atom is. Okay, So, so this is actually re very recent development, by the way, in physics, is the ability to image individual atoms. Okay, Now, those atoms are not just dots, because those are the mechanical properties, if you like. You can now um, uh, calculate... Uh, where that electron is, or all of those electrons are, uh, swirling around the nucleus. These are calculations, but up in the upper left-hand corner is called the 1s2 state, or the 1s state with two electrons in it, and it's like a circular blob, And but the 2s state is like a shell, a spherical shell, and so on. These get to be quite complicated. These are all calculated. They're not measured or observed. They're actually, they're, they're really... Uh, only calculated. But the interesting thing is, for example, if you can see the 2p state that has two electrons in it, it looks like the top and bottom lids to something, okay? And the fact that that's where the electrons are in the 2p state explains the shape of the carbon dioxide molecule, for example. In other words, there's a carbon in the middle and it, the electrons are this top and bottom here, and the two oxygen atoms hook up to those electrons and so there's a carbon atom in the middle and oxygen atoms on either side, okay? So the configuration of the electrons on the inside tell you what shape molecules are going to be in, okay? Now that's a little complicated, never mind. I want to go to the carbon atom here. The carbon atom is um, everywhere, okay, uh, in our world. And then, uh, and this is the, this is the uh, energy of the electrons in a carbon atom. And now when the elect the, what the electrons like to do is go to the very bottom state. So the lowest energy state, the lowest so-called quantum state, is the 1s state. And it can hold two electrons. Now I won't go into this in detail, but the electron has a spin. It's like a top. And so one of the electrons is spin up and the other one spin down. And they pair together like that, okay? So the 1s state has two electrons. The carbon atom total has six electrons, okay? So we're going to start counting up. Then the 2s state, which is at a higher uh, energy, also has two electrons, one spin up, one spin down. The next state up in energy is the 2p state. The 2p state will hold a total of six electrons, but there are only two more to go to get carbon. And those two, they tend to, sh they both spin up and they fill two of these six states. And the remaining four states have nothing in them. They're just empty states, okay? But they, they're states actually. Now, um, these specific energies, the 1s, the 2s, and the 2p, are very specific energies. And uh, they have the same uh, specific energies for the same reason that a plucked violin string has one note. Actually, one can describe the electrons inside of an atom as a standing wave, just like you can describe the, the uh, violin string as uh, supporting a standing wave with one energy or one note. Okay, we'll get into that later when we talk about uh, sound. Now, here's, the, here's an excited carbon atom. What you saw before was a completely stable carbon atom, no extra energy, and so on. If you look at all the states up above it, you see down at the bottom again, we have the 1s, the 2s, and the 2p state. Suppose one of the electrons in 2p state were to be uh, hit by a photon or by something else and is driven up into the 3s state, a higher energy. This would be called an excited atom. This atom has been excited. It's been 
energy has been added to it, and there's an electron sitting way up there in the 3s state. It will sit here in this state for maybe a millionth of a second or a tenth of a millionth of a second or something like that. And then very quickly, that electron will drop from the 3s state back down to the 2p state at a lower energy. So when that electron drops down, the energy difference is the energy of the 3s state minus the energy of the 2p state. That's the energy difference. So a photon of light will come out of this atom with an energy exactly equal to this energy difference between the 3s state and the 2p state. And that's all there is. That's what happens. The photon that comes out has a certain energy, a certain wavelength, and a certain color. Okay. Now there are many, many other states way at the top which are all empty. And you can, feel, and you can excite the carbon atom and excite electrons up into those states too. Okay. Now here's another, uh, see, see here's a, what I've drawn here on this one is a picture. There's the atomic energy levels, the electron here, goes to there, and so on. There are many ways to image this in the human mind. In other words, the atom does what it does, and it's a very beautiful thing. But for humans to kind of comprehend it, there are different ways of, of drawing it. So here's, for example, the, an atom picture, okay? Um, I call this atoms who process light, like banks process money, and money comes in, money goes out, right? And, and for atoms, it's the same thing. Light comes in, light goes out. So there's, a, there's a, an atom here, and has an electron in a low energy state, small radius. Photon comes in with energy E, and that electron gets, gets knocked up into a higher energy state, and that's called an atomic excitation. Now, by and by, a short time later, like a millionth of a second later, this electron drops down into the lower state, and a photon of the same energy comes out, and that's called atomic de-excitation. Okay? Now, here's an energy level picture. Uh, same thing. You have energy level E1 and E2. A photon comes in. The electron gets knocked up to energy E2, and then when it drops back down again, a photon of energy H nu comes out. Okay? So they're just different ways of depicting the same thing. Now, um, we're going to use lasers, actually, light of any diodes, actually, not, not lasers, but they function similarly. I'm not going to, I'm going to skip this over, actually, unless anybody who's interested would like to ask, I'll be glad to tell you about it. This is how a laser works, and um, I'll just say that a photon comes in, instant photon comes in from the left, it excites an atom, it de-excites and out come two identical photons. So a laser is a multiplier. You start out with one photon, you have two, then you have four, then you have eight. And all the photons coming out are in the same direction, same energy, same phase. That's the beautiful thing about, about laser. I won't describe more about a laser unless uh, somebody's interested and like to ask. So now more on the electrical properties, okay? The energy of light is the inverse of its wavelength. So now here's the formula. And this formula is written on the whiteboard in the lab. Uh, the electron volt, EV, is a convenient energy. It's a convenient unit for measuring the energies of electrons and atoms, okay? Because the energies of electrons and atoms turned out to be one electron volt or 10 electron volts and so on. Here's the formula. The energy in electron volts is equal to this number, 1240, in units of EV nanometers, divided by the wavelength in nanometers. So for example, a photon that has a wavelength of 400 nanometers, divide 400 into 1200, you get three, has an energy of about three electron volts, okay? That would probably be a green photon. So here's a picture here. There's energy levels E0, E1, and E2 at energy zero, two, and four EV. If, uh, if the electron drops from four EV down to zero EV, out will come a four electron volt blue photon of light wavelength 300 nanometers. If an electron drops from E1 down to E0, it'll be a two electron volt photon that'll be red with a wavelength of 600 nanometers. Okay, how do we measure these things? Well, we measure them with a diffraction gradient. Beautiful thing. Uh, fortunately, in, in the lab, you'll see we have very small, we have small plastic diffraction gradients. They cost about a penny a piece, actually. You buy a, a roll for $50, and it has thousands and thousands of, you know, you cut out your own sizes. So now, first off, let me say that white light, the way what we define to be white light is actually sunlight. That defines white, as long as there's nothing in the atmosphere and so on, it's white light. 
Now, here's an incandescent light bulb shown in the, in the photograph here. And if you look at that white light bulb, incandescent light bulb, it, you can see a spectrum. Okay, that's the spectrum you see looking through a diffraction gradient. So what it is, white light comes in. The diffraction gradient is some little thing here when you'll, you'll have uh, about two inch square piece of diffraction gradient. There's the zero order in the middle that's white. And then you see a rainbow or shall we say a spectrum spectrum of white light on either side. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing. And by measuring the angle of, of, the dif of this diffraction light, you can measure directly the, uh, the wavelength of the light. So first off about sunlight, this is a uh, what I call a rainbow box. And I've, I made the first one of these um, last year. I it just thought it occurred to me you could do this. You take a box, an ordinary box, and on the back side of it, you tape a piece of white paper. And on the front, you tape a hole that will let sunlight in and a hole on the left, which is an observation hole. So then after you close it up, uh, here you have the observation hole that you look through that hole. And on this side, there's a, you have a slit and you can make it a quarter inch wide if you like. And you tape a diffraction grating on the inside. Okay, So sunlight will come through here. And you and sh and then cast a spectrum on the inside, and you'll look through the, the observation hole to see it. So now here's a small video here. Uh, and on one end, we have a slit here to let the sunlight in, and there's a diffraction grating taped over the opening here. And here's a little porthole to look through. So the sun is up there in the sky, rather steep in the sky today. And so let me position this so that the sun light comes through here. Let me look through here and uh, position it. There you go. That's the rainbow inside of there. So now if you want to take a look down there. Okay, so it's rather simple to make here. You just have to keep it. You want to keep all the light out except for the sunlight that comes through here. Then there's a little background light that comes through the eye hole. But if you get your eyeball on there, then the only light inside the box is sunlight. Okay, rather simple thing to do. Kids can make the box. No problem. Okay, so this is a still photograph of what you see. That was a video about you know, a little jiggling around a little bit. But here you can see exactly what you saw in the diagram. Uh, the, the, the white strip is actually just direct th through sunlight, zeroth order. And then you can see a rather nice spectrum. Okay, So the diffraction gradient separates all the wavelengths. The, the biggest uh, deflection is red light. And then you can even see orange and yellow and green, light blue, blue, and, and violet. Okay, And then the same on the other side. Okay, So now... Uh, here, for example, is a candle. So you look at sunlight, but here's a candle. A uh, candle also has a spectrum. It's not This is not a good photograph. Uh, and candlelight isn't exactly sunlight, but it's pretty good white light. Okay, so that's a spectrum. Now, we're going to be using the handheld lasers, okay? And they're actually light-emitting diodes is really what they are. They're not true lasers. But they give off a, a, a range of wavelengths. So here is uh, the wavelength on the bottom. And... Uh, the red LED has a wavelength of like 650 nanometers. And then the green is uh, the green is around uh, 530 nanometers, and the blue is around 400 nanometers, or 405. So that's typically the, uh, the wavelengths. Now, let's set something up. Here's the, the main thing you'll do. Uh, it's... Um, <laughs> Here's a... We've seen physical images of atoms, like the graphene and the lead atoms on the substrate. We, but they were done by a very beautiful little instrument called scanning tunneling microscope. So you can see physically images of atoms now. They look like fuzzy balls all lined up. Okay? With this, actually, we can see the light that comes out of atoms, actual light. Now, what this is, is uh, there, these are appropriate for a physics lab, not elementary school. I'll try to find an alternative someday. What it is is a glass tube, and in it is a gas, okay? And inside of this is krypton gas, a very exotic gas. 
So you can look up Krypton gas in the chart in the, in the classroom, see what the spectrum looks like. We'll turn it on uh, in a minute and you'll see, you'll see with your eyes. So these are two electrodes and you put some thousands of volts across here. It excites the atoms and the electrons go up and then they, and then they um, fall back down again and emit light. So let's turn it on. So that's the spectrum that comes from krypton atoms. You can see it's white, basically it's white light. It tells you right away that there's gonna be a mixture of red, green, and blue. That's how you get white light, okay? So now, so, so now we can look, you can just look at this directly with your diffraction gradient and you'll see all the lines. You can just hold it up to your eye and look at this, even with the room lights on. It's fine, you can turn the room lights off and it maybe see more. So that we're gonna be using these, you're gonna be using these. Now, one thing I didn't like about this is that the light here comes out in all directions and it reflects off even this black surface and then it kind of makes you a fuzzy image. So what we've done over here, and this is a, a neon bulb. So what I've done is taken a regular piece of paper, which you can get from the copy machine, and I simply cut a strip out of here so that the only light that comes out of here goes towards you, the diffraction gradient. So this is going to be much cleaner spectrum. So I'll turn this on. This happens to be neon, okay, neon gas. And on he along here is um, a meter stick, and I put the, the center of the meter stick to be aligned with the, uh, the source, 50 centimeters is here. Just stacked it up on a couple of pieces of wood so that the uh, meter stick is gonna be where our laser uh, light will fall. So now we're going to have the, the atomic, the, the light from the atoms comes out this way. And here we have two lasers, and you're gonna to have to fiddle around with this to get it right. But you see, this laser is mounted carefully on here. Don't tighten the screws too tightly because it's delicate. If I turn, turn on the red laser light, you see the red laser light hits right at the 50 centimeter mark. The green laser light hits just close enough, okay, right there. So there's both red and green. And then if you look at this through your diffraction grating, you will see not only the diffracted red laser light and the diffracted green laser light, but also the helium spectrum on top of it. So now let me take an image of that. Okay, let me turn this off. Here's the phone, photo, go this way. Now I already have diffraction grading taped over the lens of the cell phone. So you just tape it on there. You have to adjust it so that it's, it's uh, right. Okay, so now, Okay, so we have our two lasers, the red and the green laser, on these mounts. And you can, you can adjust them. You'll have to fiddle around a lot to adjust them. And then um, there's these little um, cable ties which we use to keep them the buttoned on. But maybe it's better for one person with two hands to turn both on together at once and some person to take a film. But now you see what we have here. We have the uh, light coming from the atoms, the helium atoms. And then we have both the red and the green laser dots at all at one coordinate, all at the center of the meter stick. So let's see what this looks like when we turn off the moon lights. Okay, that's the thing something you should play with. And there are area lights here. So we'll use just this area light, okay? So see what it's like, okay? So it looks like that. Okay, so now here's my, ah, so here's my uh, video. No, this is my camera. And I have the diffraction grating taped over, <laughs> taped over and not, not a very good job done, but it's okay. But now I aim it right at the source and I can take maybe a video here. Maybe I'll take actually a photo. I'll take a photo rather than a video here, a photo of this. But, and so you can see the, uh, the two laser beams, the green is refracted through a smaller angle than the red because the red has a longer wavelength so it's diffracted through a larger angle. And you can see all of the lines from the helium atom up above it. So you can see that the red laser kind of tells you 
where 650 nanometers is. So you can see that one of the red lines in, from the helium atom is around 650 nanometers. Then there's one in the yellow, and then there's one down in kind of the green-blue, okay, a little bit below the wavelength of our, our uh, laser, green laser. So let me take a photo of this, okay? So now we can pull up that photo and just look at it, okay? So now what I would suggest is that um, by one means or another, if you can print this, there's a color laser printer at the back of the room that the IP address is up on the board. If you have your laptop, you can maybe uh, load this photograph onto your laptop and then print it from your laptop. And now you can put a ruler on this and you can measure things, okay? So knowing the wavelength of the, of the green light and the red light, you can make a pretty good guess what the wavelengths are of those lines. Now, um, so you can see there's a red line, there's a, there's a red, kind of a faint orange, uh, then there's a couple of green lines, and then there's a blue and even a purple line, okay? So this is the wavelength. So, so all these are all differences of energy levels inside the helium atom. And if you're careful to measure these things, you can actually figure out all the energies of electrons in the helium atom, okay? That's what you, that's what you could actually do here. And in fact, a lot of early atomic physics was figured out this way, okay? And now here is uh, that particular a photo that I just took and um, and you can see that it's actually quite precise uh, you can see all the lines all the way from the purple out to the red uh, on both sides coming from the helium and then the two laser lights give you a calibration standard they tell you where where six five hundred and thirty nanometers is and where six hundred and fifty nanometers is now I noticed when I look at this the the, the source itself the the helium gas source itself is a little too bright so I put uh, computer paper over it but actually you come to think of it black paper would be better cut a slit in black paper and maybe I should find a supply of uh, uh, heavy black paper for that purpose okay but you can see this is quite nice this is quite this, this is really a, a, a really nice experiment by the way now it does have of course um, this high voltage and this gas tube and all that which is a little too much of course for elementary school I was hoping to, uh, and I ha don't have one yet, to get a relatively high power blue laser or purple laser and use that, use the blue laser light to excite the gas inside the tube rather than using high voltage, okay? And I still have to test that and maybe this semester the TAs, your TA, uh, will, will test this and see if it will work that way. And if it does, we'll be proud to tell you about it. Okay, so the next uh, one is a short description of what goes on here. Uh, make a drawing of what we just measured, okay? Here's a drawing of what we've just done. Uh, here's the atomic light source in the middle. And uh, here's your eyeball, which is looking through a diffraction gradient. So let me actually kind of draw a diffraction gradient there, okay? So you look through. And what do you see? Well, off at an angle, some angle theta, you see the green laser dot and also, the, I mean, the red laser dot and also the red line from the helium atoms. And then also there's the green laser dot is here and some green lines and there are a couple of blue lines from the helium atom. And then it's the same on both sides, okay? So that's, uh, that's what you see. And this angle theta is what measures the wavelength of the light. The actual relationship is that the sine, this is a trigonometry function, the sine of theta is the wavelength lambda divided by d, and d is the very tiny spacing on the diffraction gradient, but let's not worry about that. The important point is, is that the angle theta goes with lambda. So the bigger wavelength, the, the bigger the wavelength, the bigger the theta, okay? So here are the wavelengths here. The red light is 650 nanometers, and that will, for your particular diffraction gradient, that will correspond to some angle theta actually some angle sine theta, but never mind whether it's theta or sine theta. So that's the, that's the uh, actual formula to use to get a precise result. But for, your, but for our work here, we have a meter stick here, and you can kind of read off so many centimeters and sort of guess at what the, the blue is, for example, kind of guess what the green line is, and that's good enough. Well, now here are a whole collection of atoms. This is a spectrum of um, many atoms you can see that everyone's different. So the spectrum of an atom is like a fingerprint. 
So uh, when you're at a crime scene investigation, for example, and you want to know whether there's some sodium around or whatever, you can, you can do a spectrograph and uh, completely nail the atoms that are there. Now, these atoms, these, these lines are really just the ones in the visible. You can see at the bottom, there is the visible spectrum, right? Basically a sun spectrum. And so these are the ones that are seen by our retina. So our human retina is, is sensitive to only the visible spectrum. That's why it's called visible, by the way. And then the ultraviolet and the infrared are outside this region, okay? So um, here's a small note, a side note, actually, on ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet means it's beyond the blue. It's even higher energy than blue light. And uh, because it's so important, there are three bands, A, B, and C bands. So when you buy suntan lotion, it'll tell you whether it's A or B, okay? And so uh, the A band is from three, or three to four electron volts, which is already moderately high. Uh, the B band is from four to four and a half electron volts, and that's mostly absorbed by the ozone layer that surrounds the Earth, okay? You can Google that and, and read about it. It's called the ozone layer. And the C band is much higher energy. It's four and a half to 12 electron volts. Fortunately for us, that's completely absorbed by the ozone layer. So the ozone layer protects us from basically skin cancer. I mean, if the ozone layer weren't there, we would be in trouble. I mean, our, we would have to adapt in ways that, uh, that we don't have now. Okay, now infrared light is below, is, is, is below the red in energy, is much lower energy. And we detect it as heat. That's what we call heat. So you turn on an oven or a fireplace, what you're feeling is actually infrared light. Okay. Okay, so that's it for atoms. Now there's one other small uh, thing about atoms. There are nuclear properties. Of course, we looked at all of the mechanical and electrical properties have to do with all those electrons that go around, okay? It doesn't care very much uh, what the nucleus is, okay? Well, there are nuclear properties too. And I may uh, get a, a, a Geiger counter uh, into the lab, but unfortunately, I, I don't have one my hands on one now, but they cost like $500 or so, and you can detect nuclear particles coming out of nuclei, right? So there, there are three kinds, alpha, beta, and gamma. And alpha, the alpha particle is really just a helium nucleus, very, very stable particle. It is stopped by a piece of paper, okay? Or by the first layer of dead, dead cells on your skin, dead skin cells. A beta ray is really just an electron that came out of a nucleus instead of out of the outer part of the atom. It's stopped by roughly two centimeters of water. That's enough to stop a beta ray. A nuclear beta ray and then there's the gamma ray and it's really just a photon a very high energy photon of light it's you need about 10 centimeters of lead or, or iron to stop that okay so those are the three basic kinds and uh, their, their sources so let me finish up here with um, what to do in, in lab this week well the first thing is you should mount a plastic diffraction grating using a mil manila folder paper just cut out a square and a square inside the square and, and, and tape a diffraction grating on there. And you can put notes on there for, um, um, you know, what, uh, uh, what uh, the diffraction grating uh, refracts or bends light in one direction. So maybe you want it to bend left and right. So be careful, you can mark it that way. Then I would suggest just with the diffraction grating in your fingers and hang on to the manila folder so you don't get fingerprints all over the diffraction grating itself, Look at white light, okay? Um, if you want to go look at sunlight directly, that's good. Well, you should project it onto a piece of paper. Don't look through. Don't look at the sun, all right? And then look at other white lights. For example, LEDs or, or just take a white laptop screen and look at that. Or look at the uh, phone, the flashlight in on your phone. Or look at a candle if you can. Anything that looks like white light. Uh, look through your direction. Grade. And any other color, too. And you can see what the composition is. The, the color composition is of any light source. Now, with a, I'd like you to measure the angle of deflection for red and the green laser light, the LED light, I should say. Um, in other words, just put some rulers down and you can measure how many centimeters of deflection there is, you know, in a meters after a, in, in a meters distance, okay? Um, to get an idea of, of what the sizes are. And you can see they're quite measurable. And if you really had a really good meter stick and, and, and we're very careful here, you could really measure uh, this deflection angle very accurately and thereby measure a wavelength of light very accurately. 
So then, then you go to the atomic source, mount your red and green lasers that is shown in the video, and shine them at the base of the atomic source tube, either at the white base or I shine them onto the meter stick itself. It's good enough. It, it reflects the light back again and, and you, you still get a, you can still uh, see red and, and green light. Then turn on the source and uh, mount the diffraction grating over the lens of your cell phone. Okay. And then just look through it. Turn on the both lasers, turn on the source and, and, and see. Then take a photo. I would suggest printing it. There is a uh, color laser printer in the back of, in the front actually now, the front of the lab. And then you can put, um, you know, take a little plastic ruler and you can, you can just measure, measure in millimeters the deflection and compare it to the red and green. And knowing those wavelengths, try to copy down for what, whatever source you have, copy down the, the wavelengths, okay? And, and then just for fun, and then you, you, maybe you should not look at the, the, each source actually is labeled. Each atomic source is labeled as krypton or sodium or hydrogen. Don't look at that at first, okay? Just measure all the wavelengths you can. And then there's a, a chart of uh, all the many, 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 many uh, elements, uh, the diffraction spectrum uh, in the, um, on the on the whiteboard in the in the, on the left side of the whiteboard in, in the lab and go up there and see if you can actually find the element you have okay without knowing see if you can find it by looking at its spectrum okay and then um, another thing I did accidentally actually once I had a diffraction grading over my cell phone and then I went outside at night and uh, with a video and just looked around and just took a video recording and actually all the white lights in the in the neighborhood that you got a spectrum and then the, the street lamp itself was actually a sodium street lamp. So you saw the sodium spectrum there. And um, I thought that would be a nice thing if to, to make uh, glasses that actually had diffraction gratings instead of lenses on them. And then you can walk around at night and it's actually quite a, a pleasant uh, light show if you like. Okay, so that's it and um, for today. And uh, I hope you have a good time. This is a, a challenging lab, okay, because you're going to see things you haven't seen before, do things. But really, um, the, the, the videos that I have looked at are very good, and I think you're to be complimented on doing a wonderful job. So it's, it's just great. And uh, have fun with this one, and uh, I'll see you later in the week.